Hey everyone. Today we are diving into what some religious folks call providence. Some call the Tao Te Ching. Some people call it coincidence. <laughs> and some folks don't believe in it at all. And that is uh, the topic that really brought me into an understanding of what it means to trust the universe. Uh, whether we call it providence or the, the Tao. Uh, leaning into this idea that everything happens for an infinite goal, which is a heavenly community in the cosmos and in the spiritual realm. That's at least one idea around it. Uh, some believe that God uh, does everything for a purpose, that everything happens for a purpose. I think in a way that's true, but it's often a little trite. You know, you tell someone this bad thing has happened to you for a reason and just, you know, accept that. I think that's tough for people to hear. But we know from our own lives that when we look back on all those tough moments, those things that we've grown from, that we become who we are today, we have qualities that we wouldn't have otherwise um, today because of the trial of that situation. It wasn't the pain or the horrific thing or whatever it is, traumatizing uh, experience that just gifted it to us, but it was our strength of spirit, of mind, of soul, of heart, of will that allows us to continue to learn from those past experiences, to continue to grow and use everything that happens to us, potentially and maybe eventually, for the good. And that's exactly what the mystic Emanuel Swedenborg thought occurred with everything that happened in life. And this mystic uh, from the 1700s, 18th century, uh, he was an inspiration for Jung, we all know the psychotherapist and uh, great thinker, Carl Jung. Uh, he was a big reader of Swedenborg. It seems as though he got a lot of his ideas around archetypes and dream symbols from Swedenborg, uh, funny enough. Uh, and he also inspired folks like Helen Keller, someone that we forget was a very active socialist speaker and thinker. Um, you know, and socialists, run the gamut in terms of how they behave. Some socialists don't know they're socialists. They just know they love police officers and firefighters in the military, which are all socialist <laughs> things uh, by definition, right? Socialist things. Uh, some know they're socialists and they want, uh, you know, food programs for uh, everyone. They want a minimum a wage that can actually help people pay their bills um, or actually allow them to pay their bills. Uh, some want uh, monthly minimum income because we're the most productive we've ever been and yet the workers are the most pressed and the most overworked. Uh, but the stocks are great, so I guess we shouldn't <laughs> worry about all the humans, you know. Um, so funny enough, there's a variety of socialists and Helen Keller was a real forward thinker in terms of this. You can read many of her lectures which you could say were a heart, the heart of her, her work uh, throughout many decades of her life, were her lectures, not just about people with uh, differently abled uh, bodies and abilities, but about uh, socialism, essentially, about helping other people, about you know, doing what we always have done as humankind in villages, in village settings, which is help people, is help each other, uh, feed each other. Somebody finds, you know, a outcropping of fruit, they don't say, well, now I have all this fruit I can sell to my fellow villagers. No, they're like, hey, come over here. And same with any idea, with any discovery. Uh, that's the way some people think it should be, and I think uh, they're onto something there. And we do that naturally, even in capitalism, in a large way, but we forget that the heart of what makes a corporation good, what makes an organization good, is this culture of sharing, of uplifting each other, 
when the CEO makes 300 times their average worker pay, which is the you know normally the case nowadays, uh, people feel put on. They feel pressed, and they're not willing to do the work. And we're going to see where that leads if we haven't already. And so Swedenborg, I think of as like a seed, someone who's inspired, you know, people like Emerson as well and others to really think uh, forwardly and to really think deeply about the human consciousness, the human mind. Uh, one of my favorite psychotherapists in history is uh, Wilson Van Dusen, uh, Dr. Wilson Van Dusen. And uh, it's amazing hearing his accounts in some of his books about leading a, a mental ward and how he was one of the few uh, people leading this approach where they accepted what people thought they saw. They, uh, at least they presented themselves as wanting to hear about their experiences, that voice in their head, that light, that shadow, that whatever. And they took it very seriously and he found that that helped you know, these people, these human beings, <laughs> uh, accept their experience and start to discover some ways out, some hierarchies within their visions. Um, and so today, when we talk about providence, I can't help but talk about Swedenborg, but he, because he believed that the smallest detail must be governed by the Tao, by the higher power. It's all connected, right? Everything's connected. We all know it started in a little space, at least supposedly, uh, we know that, uh, with the Big Bang. And ev so everything must be somewhat connected through quantum entanglement, uh, through the interactions. We know that consciousness is what allows all these probability functions of particles to collapse into a single situation, a single moment, a single point. And so everything is connected and, and connected with consciousness. And he believed that through that connectivity, that unity, that unity of the universe, so to speak, everything has an ultimate purpose, which is the flowering of the universe, which is the flowering of life itself. And um, what is life? It's good. It's good. Now, Swedenborg was a big proponent of the Bible, funny enough, <laughs> at least certain books of the Bible. He thought that certain books of the Bible were like, I don't know, uh, a sage high on ayahuasca speaking poetry. Like there's multiple layers <laughs> of this thing. He thought there was a literal layer where it was talking about, hey, we're the Hebrew people, we're the Jewish people, this has been our experience. This is what it seems like God has done to us or with us or for us. And this is what people believe. But then the poetry had such a symbol set and such a, a stable metaphorical meaning that it points to and it hints at all over the place that you can start to read each of the lines of poetry to actually be developed and more importantly crafted to speak of the human condition. So for example, when he interpreted the seven days of creation in the Bible, which a lot of evangelicals and others have taken quite literally, um, and some people take it literally, but as aliens terraforming our earth. So there you go, uh, for literalists, uh, grapple with that one, huh? Uh, the Elohim, the plurality of the Elohim versus Yahweh, if you read, Elohim is different than Yahweh, you start to see, oh, there's like multiple characters that we interpret as God in the English that might have been fighting it back and forth. Maybe they're aliens or something. Uh, some people take it that way. But Swedenborg, he took it metaphorically as a structured description of human progress. And he did say you can be on multiple days at the same time. You can kind of oscillate as you grow like any tree has its own kind of way of growing in its environment. But overall, it's a structured um, diagram, a verbal diagram of human progress. And what does the seven days of creation end with? 
It is a Sabbath. It's God. It's Spirit. Finding rest. And that's ultimately what Swedenborg and many sages throughout Buddhism, throughout uh, even Catholic sages, certain ones, um, run, runs the gamut from Taoism to Hinduism, um, believed is our ultimate highest state. Our, not that we don't keep developing. Actually, Swedenborg said that's kind of the beginning of the real life of humanity is the seventh day of Sabbath, of creation. Um, but it's, it's kind of the arc for us here on earth for the most part. Unless you know yourself to be an awakened sage, and believe me, you know it if you're there, and I don't mean it just narcissistically, which some people will believe it just narcissistically, that I'm the best. Uh, no, but if you know that you're one with the universe, if you see how everything fits together, how every single thing comes and falls perfectly and you believe it but also you know it you see it you are it as christ said of himself i am the way the truth the life he knew it he felt it he perceived it um for the rest of us <laughs> we're somewhere in this seven days of creation coming to our sabbath point our sabbath birth you could say um into the Garden of Eden, right? Into peace and life in a more full state, in, a, in an awakened state. So I believe that's true, you know, not because of Swedenborg necessarily, but from personal experience, I have a little uh, experience coming to moments of that, of that Sabbath, of that uh, perception, but also just listening to other speakers out there. You know, you may know of them you may be one of them that have experience in this in this state of flow of a perceived perfection even though things are falling apart and that kind of brings us back to providence right providence is seeing is knowing it is the thing that falls perfectly but knowing's part of that consciousness is inherent to things happening. Funny enough, it's crazy. I feel like scientists are going to have the hardest time just accepting their own science from here on forward. It's been that way for most of the century. Uh, this last hundred years, I mean, uh, people don't uh, wrap their heads around, scientists have a hard time wrapping their heads around the implications of quantum physics. Um, and it's often not explained in a way that helps us um, down the line from the scientists to have any real uh, reception of it either, right? This idea that literally, literally, uh, particles are in a probabilistic state, meaning they, some percentage of a chance they're here and some here and, and the same one here and here. Not only is that just a, by chance I hit the ball and it could go there. No, it's literally in those states at the same time that's what we call um the the gleaming the the understanding we got from the two slit experiment that you know of and from others more recent that have kind of solidified this idea even more beautifully in a way more complicated but more more uh clearly that particles what we call matter whatever that is right is in are in multiple probabilistic states, literally in those states at the same time, until consciousness interacts with it. But not only that, until something that inter interacts with it that will be perceived by consciousness and it depends on. So then you have all these chain reactions of consciousness creating our universe, literally being the thing that makes a material choose a lane. Whereas before it was this nebulous thing and after as well after that moment of perception so it's way over my head <laughs> but the more we can kind of grok it understand it a little the more we start to see wow like things are way more interconnected and beautiful than i could have ever imagined the universe is literally 
making up its mind as it goes along. It's literally in different states. And when perception hits it, it's like, okay, I'm here. You could think of it that way. You could think of it that way, right? We do know that consciousness is part of the equation. And so I'll leave that uh, to you as uh, you'll take it. And to me, it means that consciousness is an inherent part of the universe. Whatever you think of the implications of that, we know that consciousness is the thing that allows things, literal things. What we would think of as material, it's not material without consciousness. Crazy, right? And yet our science likes to start behind, behind the, the figure and, and try to work its way back to the thing that is the closest to what we are, consciousness itself. We like to start with the material instead of the heart of the experience, which is consciousness itself. You know, if there is no thing without consciousness, and consciousness is our entire ex experience, we need to start there, right? We need to start with consciousness. And in fact, that's what matters to people. We think it's material that matters to people because we've made this idea of the world that's about scarcity. It's about collecting. We have literal billionaire dragons, right, on their hordes of cash, but they get to put them in banks. It's not really in the bank either because most of it's made up. And there's only a small part of it that's actually ever printed as cash. Um, you know, I, I digress, right? But we know that for a fact from our e economics. I have an economics degree and a finance degree. I try not to use <laughs> to the best of my ability. Um, but we know, <laughs> we, yeah, it's true. Um, I also have my CFA, or I had it, it's retired, uh, my CFA. But anyway, um, we know these things are connected and that what really matters to people is their experience. You ask someone who's starving, why does it matter that you have no food? What are you talking you know, there's a bunch of food behind this glass. You know, isn't that enough? He's like, no, I, I haven't ate it. He's like, well, why do you need to eat it? You're just going to get rid of it, right? It just passes on. It's like, well, I feel terrible and I'm going to die. I need resources. This body needs resources, at least in the state it's in now. And so it's about the experience of starvation. It's about the fear of passing along but also the fact that we want to be here for other people because they care. It would hurt them if we disappeared, you know. It's not just a game about money and the bottom line. What is, what's the point of the bottom line? It's about people. It's about how people feel. It's about their experience. It's about wisdom. It's about love. And so, ultimately, that's what the universe is about. And Providence you could say, according to Swedenborg, is meant to uplift the beauty of that over time. Sometimes we have to take a sharp dive to find those minerals, those minerals around the seedling that we are as humanity, to be able to grow into the beautiful tree that we're going to become, that we are destined to become. All the, all the world religions say it. That's the other thing about scripture. You know, Get out of the whole, you know, whether you're on this book or that one, you're going to hell if you're in this one, if you're going to hell if you like that other one, uh, but you're, you're good if you have my book, but you interpret it my way. No, let's forget all that uh, craziness of religion and just look at a lot of these teachings. They point to a future of humanity that's beyond comprehension, that's beautiful. Um, you know, some have prophecies of prophets coming back. We see that throughout Buddhism. Of, there'll be Padmasambhava comes back, Bodhidharma comes back, uh, Sun Tzu or uh, Lao Tzu comes back uh, in the future. Uh, even that movie Monkey King, uh, I think it's called Monkey King, about uh, the fighting uh, Indian gentleman uh, who takes on the mob. Uh, in the movie, it's really good, very violent if you're not into that kind of thing. That's hinting a lot at some of the prophecies uh, from India, from Hindu, from what we call Hinduism, the Vedic traditions. Um, 
of prophet coming back of a god coming back uh actually it's it's a monkey king uh that comes back and saves humanity from oppression um and we see that in dragon ball z it's inspired by a similar character from china uh with the journey to the west um you know we see it all over the place of course in christianity as well we have these prophecies of christ coming back of christ consciousness or christ depending on your line of Christianity, how you interpret things, coming back, uh, growing, uh, blooming into the crown of all the churches. That's the future of humanity. Um, crown of all the communities, you could say. Crown of all the expressions of spirit. Uh, meaning that humanity has a special place, according to a lot of these stories. Not just, not just on planet Earth, we have a special place, of course. But in the universe, amongst all our brothers and sisters, or what have you, um, and what have you, around us, all the uh, ETs and spirits and other guides as well, we have a place um, that's burgeoning, that's starting, I believe, even now, to sprout among uh, this infinite thing we call the universe. We have a beautiful place as the crown of the churches. So if that's true, providence must be leading us to that state and although we think we have a lot of control over our lives a lot of times it's our hang-ups it's our addictions it's our what have you that drive us and when it's not that it's a greater wisdom a greater spirit a greater knowing a greater will that flows through us and so you could say in the gamut of human experience it's providence you know we're led by other things we're our genes are passed down, our ability to do, to want to do. We don't know where that comes from. You know, we weren't babies building up our ability to do. And if we were, where did the ability to build that come from, right? It's passed down, it's interconnectedness, it's spirit, it's life. It's what we call uh, the human experience. So that's what I think of when I think of providence and the interconnectedness of things. And according to our sages, including Christ, everything happens according to the Lord's will for a greater good. Now, that doesn't mean that every evil thing happens according to the Lord's will, but that through our sense of free will, that evil that we're allowed to do to some degree, not to an infinite degree, but to some small degree in terms of our ability, in terms of opportunity, um, terms of a lot of different things right a lot of things have to come together even for one bad thing to occur there has to be a planet and some gravity has to be some space some air uh, you know you can keep going right um that's allowed for our free will but it's but it's used it's going to be used we learn from it the evil person maybe a few lives down the line will learn from it um maybe from coming out of a deep part of hell we'll learn from it uh, we'll learn from it on the other side as other people just seeing it happen, the consequences, maybe feeling the consequences, maybe being set upon, we grow stronger. There's a lot of things that a hard place uh, does. You know, there's a lot of th good things that a hard place uh, brings about in terms of our lives. We come out of it renewed, refreshed, and with a deeper understanding of the universe. And even to those of us in the midst of that hard time, I believe there will come a day where you'll look back in this life or the next and see how you're stronger for it, how you grew. And we see that in our plants. We see that example around us, how things can start in a very cold, dank, <laughs> hard place, but that seedling still sprout. And it uses the minerals that we thought of as so hard to become something amazing, something beautiful. So thanks for joining me in that exploration today about Providence. Uh, follow and like uh, this video uh, wherever you find it for more and for uh, the algorithm, so to speak, uh, especially if you made it this far, man, hats off to you. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, peace.